both are typically highly unified. That is, we have we don't just have a uh, uh, have a list of features of this person in our head. Rather, we organize this all this information into a single unified uh, unified description. Go back for a second. When you look at something like this, there's a single impression that this person is trying to convey to the reader. Okay, a lot of different words, a lot of different features, but overall, you get a single impression, something that can be uh, 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 spoken of in a couple of words or a couple of phrases. That's what Ash was all about. Okay, um, and he said, okay, uh, we don't, although a person makes many tendencies to form a view of one person, a view that embraces his entire being or as much of it as is acceptable to us. Okay, so that's what that's a problem of person perception that Ash tried to study, and he uh, argued that there were two ways we can think about um, uh, impression formation. Uh, uh, first, we want to know how is it that people organize all the information that's available uh, 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 about a person into this single unified impression. How do our impressions change across time? You meet a person, you encounter them again and again and again and again. Uh, does that uh, impression remain stable or does it change at all? And then uh, how, does, how do these percepts affect other kinds of psychological processes? To study this, ah. Ash uh, uh, invented a paradigm which we now uh, think of as the impression formation paradigm in which subjects were brought into the laboratory and simply asked to read a passage or study a list of words, what Ash called the trade ensemble, that described some target person. Not a person they know, a stranger. And then uh, they're asked to provide their impressions of that person, either in a free description or by completing an adjective checklist or by filling out some rating scales. It doesn't matter how you do it. Uh, you, get, you get some information, and then you uh, uh, form an impression of the person on other terms. Make it concrete. Here, in, from Ash's first experiment, some subjects viewed these seven terms, intelligent, skillful, industrious, warm, determined, practical, and cautious. Another group of subjects viewed these terms, intelligent, skillful, industrious, cold, determined, practical, and cautious. Same set of words, with just one exception. Set A, the person is described as warm. Set B, the person is described as cold. Then Ash asked the subjects to rate that person on a series of rating scales where none of the stimulus words occurred in the rating scale. There'd be no point in that. Asking them to make inferences. Given what you know about the person now, what else do you think that person uh, is like? And what Ash found was that the two sets of adjectives gave rise to markedly different impressions of the person. Uh, here we have all those traits that the people uh, were, uh, were being rated on. Set A in green, set B in blue. And you can see that for most of these traits, there are big differences between the two sets. Whether you describe somebody as warm or cold, holding all the other information constant made a big difference to the impression uh, that people had of, uh, of the individual's personality. Okay, those are just some of the traits that, uh, uh, that showed up as different between, uh, between the two sets. Don't commit any of this to memory, right? Uh, but if you want to know, that's what they're like. Okay, now let's do, let's do this again. Well, okay, so you change a word, you change the impression. Not true. Here, from Ash's experiment three, the same set of six stimulus words, the seventh word is now either polite or blunt. Okay, that's the difference between the two sets. When you repeat the experiment with just that change, changing warm to polite and cold to blunt, what you see is there's very little difference between the, the uh, descriptions that are provided from set A and set B. So uh, maybe on one or two, but nothing like what we saw in experiment one. Describing somebody as warm or cold makes a huge difference to the impression that we have of their personality. Describing somebody as polite or blunt doesn't make very much, uh, very much difference uh, at all. Okay. On the basis of these kinds of experiments, Ash ran a whole bunch of them, he argued that impression formation was dominated by what he called central traits. A central trait is a quality that, when changed, alters the entire impression of the person. Okay? Um, that, uh, describing somebody as warm or blunt really makes, a big, uh, really makes a big difference. Why did this do this? Sorry. Something has been turned on that I'll have to turn off later. Okay, in any event, uh, he argued that what happened, remember, Ash was a Gestalt psychologist. What did the Gestalt psychologist think? The whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? And what Ash argued that was that when you slip a word like warm or cold into a description of a person, that single word changes the meaning of all the other words. Okay, that's what's known as a change of meaning hypothesis. The environmental surround changes its, uh, the, uh, the meaning of the individual elements. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, and that the central traits alter the meaning of other traits. So to go back here for a second, okay, there we are. Uh, when you call somebody industrious and warm, industrious means something different. Uh, Ash argued, then when you call somebody industrious and cold, you get a very different sense of how industrious they are and what, 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 their, what qualities of industry uh, 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 there are. So these central traits uh, seem to make this big, uh, this big difference. Okay. okay. And as I, as I say, going on, um, Ash uh, uh, determined that there were some uh, traits that really seemed to be central in this sense, that they had a radical effect, an extraordinarily large effect on impression formation. Other traits, when you change them, it didn't matter very much. And the two that most consistently emerged as central were warm and cold, as in Ash's experiment one. And there was another experiment in which all these was a very intelligent and unintelligent. Uh, and that made a huge difference to the impression um, uh, uh, that people had. Uh, whereas words like polite and blunt were obviously more peripheral to impression formation because changing them didn't seem to make, uh, seem to make very much difference. Okay, uh, for those of you who are following along with the preliminary slides, we're going to skip a couple now. Um, Oh, not yet. We're going to do this, this one, too. Uh, Ash also discovered what are known as order effects in impression formation. Here's essentially the stimulus set from experiment one. Okay, um, Same words, except that intelligent is the first item the subjects read in set A, and it was the last item the subjects read in set B. And again, what you discover here when you do it, data is not quite as clear, but statistically it is, uh, whether intelligence appears as the first thing you learn about the person or the last thing about, you learn about the person uh, uh, has a big effect on, uh, on the impression. Again, the stimulus words themselves are the same in the two sets. All that Ash did was to vary the order. The first thing you learn is the person's intelligence or warm, the last, or the last thing you learn is that the person is intelligent uh, or warm. And again, what Ash argued was that these order effects are created because each element in the stimulus set influences um, uh, the, the, uh, the meaning of the others. When you learn first thing right off, this person, person is very intelligent, you now interpret all the other things you learn in light of your knowledge that the person's intelligent. If you only learn later that the person's intelligent, you've already formed an impression of the person, and there's much less latitude uh, for, uh, for change. So again, what he argued was that the initial terms that we, that we, uh, that we uh, perceive um, set up what he called a directed impression, that is, direct the impression in one way or, uh, or another, and that the later terms are interpreted through this uh, first uh, impression. And he said, just kind of in terms of adaptive significance, these order effects tend to render perception stable, that what the first 
thing you learn about something kind of continues to influence the perception so that percepts don't change radically uh, over, uh, over time. He thought that was, uh, that was a good thing. Okay, so um, just to kind of what, uh, motivate you here a little bit, uh, what I had originally planned to do, and I, because of time I've decided not to do here, is to talk about another research tradition using the same sorts of procedures that Ash used, associated uh, with a guy by the name of Norman Anderson, who spent his career, now retired, spent his career at the University of California, San Diego, uh, who argued for a competing view of, um, of, uh, of impression formation. Ash, being a Gestalt psychologist, argued that the whole, the impression that you have of, of a person, is greater than the sum of its parts, different than, greater than the, in, uh, the values of the individual elements, those seven trade adjectives or whatever. What Anderson argued was that, to the contrary, was that the whole is exactly the sum of its parts, right? What you basically do is engage in some kind of additive process to form your unified impression of the person. I won't take time today because I want to do something else uh, to go over that, but if you're really interested in it, you're not going to be held responsible for it. If you're really interested in it, go to the lecture supplements on person perception, and I'll take you through um, Anderson's information integration uh, theory of person perception. Let's just stick with Ash right now. Going over this, over, 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 okay. There we go. Okay, so now sticking with Ash, we have these two big findings. First, that there are order effects in impression formation. Okay, early information changes the impression more than later writing information. And most important for present purposes, we have uh, this distinction between central and peripheral traits. Some traits seem to make a big difference to an impression, other traits uh, don't make much of a difference uh, at all. And the real question is, what makes a, a, a trait central? For Ash, he just stumbled on this. He didn't have a particular theory that warm and cold and intelligent and unintelligent would be central to impression formation. Uh, they were just, they're basically just words, uh, words that came to mind to him when he was constructing uh, his stimulus set. Um, and it's, uh, but, he, but he had the intuition that it's not just a matter of happenstance. Okay, that warm versus cold, intelligent versus unintelligent, make a big difference uh, to impression formation. There must be something about these qualities, must be something about these features that are, uh, are really important. Uh, Ash himself did not solve this problem. He went on to study other kinds of things. Uh, many of you will know him from the Ash conformity paradigm. He studied in social psychology, he's the same Ash. Um, uh, but uh, his, uh, his friend, uh, Julius Wishner, one of my teachers at the University of Pennsylvania, did attack this problem uh, in, in a particular way. And what Wishner did was to take trait terms like warm and cold and intelligent and unintelligent and polite and blunt and examine their correlation with other trait terms, industrious, aggressive, polite, practical, uh, whatever. And what Wishner discovered was that words like warm and cold and intelligent and unintelligent are more highly correlated with other trait terms than are words like polite and blunt. What that means is, as Wishner put it, central traits carry more information than other traits because of the pattern of correlation associated with words like warm and cold and polite and blunt. Um, uh, if I tell you somebody's warm, you can actually draw on those correlations to make all sorts of inferences about what other qualities a person has. If I tell you that somebody's polite versus blunt, there aren't that many correlations, so you can't draw on these correlations to make a lot of inferences. It's the pattern of correlation, the strength of correlation, that makes the trait uh, central or not. Because if you change, if, if, if one trait is correlated with lots of other traits, changing the person standing on that trait is going to change the person standing on lots of other traits. That's just pure, uh, uh, pure mathematics. So that was Wishner's, uh, the, w Wishner's solution, and he had it almost right, not quite uh, right, uh, because the implication of this is that any trait can be a central trait so long as it's highly correlated with lots of other traits. Okay? But that turns out not to be quite true. Seymour Rosenberg at Rutgers did a reanalysis of, uh, of Wishner's data using a technique called factor analysis that we don't have to uh, 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 go into here. But what factor analysis does is to take a pattern of correlations among elements and extract from that pattern of correlation a set of fundamental dimensions that runs throughout the entire correlation matrix. That is, the uh, fundamental dimensions like length and width and height, okay, in the non-social case. What are the fundamental uh, dimensions in the social case? Well, what Rosenberg discovered was that there are two big super factors, two big dimensions that run through all sorts of rating experiments where people are describing themselves or rating themselves or rating other people or whatever. And these are super, these super factors Rosenberg characterized as social good, is the person nice or not nice, and intellectual good, bad, is the person smart or, uh, or not smart. And what's interesting about this ah, is that the very traits that Ash identified as central, central to impression formation lie very close to these factors. So here's unintelligence, Rosenberg spelled it wrong in the paper, and intelligence lying very close to the good-bad intellectual dimension, and here's cold and warm, not quite so good, but pretty good, uh, lying very close to these others. The implication of Rosenberg's analysis is that the closer you lie to one of these axes, intellectual good-bad, smart, not smart, social good-bad, warm, cold, the more central the trait is going to be to impression formation, because these traits carry, traits that lie close to these axes carry a lot more information. If I tell you somebody's vain, or tolerant, that tells you a lot about that person because it tells you that he's got other, all sorts of other bad or good social, uh, 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 social traits. If I tell you somebody's dishonest or stern, maybe, uh, those lies far away from the axis, and it just doesn't tell you that much. You know he's stern or dishonest, but it doesn't tell you whether he's a nice guy. Lots of psychopaths are very nice people, okay? And it doesn't tell you whether he's smart, uh, 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 smart or stupid. So again, Rosenberg argued uh, on the basis of his analysis that what makes a central trait central is that it captures one or the other of these two basic dimensions of impression formation, warm versus cold, intelligent versus unintelligent. More recently, the literature on personality uh, uh, assessment and person perception has suggested that a little bit more differentiated view of, um, of, uh, of impression formation, uh, which is that, um, here we are, I'm gonna finish this right here, there we go. Where are we? I'm getting, I'm getting here. Some of you will know about the so-called big five model of personality traits. It turns out that there's not just two factors that run through uh, a personality description. It's closer to five. These are known as the big five personality traits, neuroticism, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness to experience. These five dimensions, these five factors, have been extracted whenever anybody has analyzed a set of personality ratings of, uh, of sufficient size, no matter who's doing it, no matter what culture, no matter uh, what, uh, what age or whatever, leading some people, like Louis Goldberg at the University of Oregon, to argue that this five-factor model, the so-called big five personality traits, is a universal structure of personality that is encoded in our language. We have, we have nice terms for, in language uh, uh, for, for each of these uh, dimensions, and more important, is valid across cultures. You can use these same five personality traits to um, 
to uh, describe people in tribesmen in South America, uh, as you would to describe uh, workers, uh, workers in Germany, and also valid across generations and developmental ethics and, uh, and so on. Rosenberg's distinction between intellectual and social good-bad is a very good way to think about what makes a trait central. I think an even better way is to say that I suspect that central traits lie close to any one of these factors. These are the fund fundamental dimensions of impression formation. These are the things that you want to know about another person. This, this is the information you want to convey about another person, so much so that I call them the five blind date questions. Of all the things you want to know about somebody that you're going to spend, uh, spend some time with, these are the things you want to know. Is he outgoing? Extroversion? Is he crazy? Neuroticism? Is he friendly? Agreeable? Agreeableness? Is he reliable? Conscientiousness? And is he interesting? Openness to experience? If you think about it for a second, there isn't anything else you really need to know about somebody. Okay? Um, and these are probably likely to be the central traits in impression formation. Okay, we'll look at another aspect of person perception next time. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend.